Hey everyone, this is Christopher Luxon, the former CEO of Air New Zealand. This is John Lee Dumas, the founder and host of Entrepreneurs on Fire. This is Tracy Ibarra. I'm an executive solutions at Dell Technologies. This is Travis Chappell, founder of Build Your Network. If you are wanting to learn how to embrace change to navigate through disruption as a leader, then listen to the Leadership is Changing podcast. The Leadership is Changing podcast. The Leadership is Changing podcast with my good friend, my very good friend, Dennis Giannoutsos. Welcome to Leadership is Changing. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change. This is taking your leadership to another level by finding the balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsos. Christy, a big welcome to you. Yes, thank you so much for having me. This is such an important topic, and I agree with everything you said. It's changing, and change is constant, and the description you gave about running email to email, meeting to meeting sounds really familiar, so I think this is really important, and I'm so excited to be here. Great. Thank you. And yeah, you're right. I mean, people are going from email to email, marketing, meeting to meeting. And I don't know about you, but I've, I've some of these people I'm working with, some of these coaches, it's quite interesting to see what happens. They get to some meetings and they check in their phones, not to see what email they've got, but what meeting is this? Because they have no idea. And then they're tending to do that a lot. So Christy, we've, uh, I've given the introduction to our listeners uh, in relation to you a little bit. Tell me or tell us a little bit more about your background. Yeah, you bet. So like you mentioned, I've been at eBay. Funny enough, I think I need to update my profile. I've now actually been there almost 20 years, if you can believe wow. that. So I'm yeah. about to hit my 20 year anniversary in March. And so really, I've been there 20 years, but I've been under multiple CEOs, multiple. I've been through extreme growth, extreme, you know, some turnarounds. I've really been at one company, but it feels like I've been at five or six. And prior to that, I did my undergrad at the University of Wyoming and grew up in Wyoming. So, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Awesome. And I think we actually, uh, we being Hewlett Packard, took one of your CEOs, actually. So we had Meg Whitman come and, look, come and become our CEO. That's right. That's right. I was under Meg Whitman. I think she was the CEO when I first joined. So I was obviously under her the whole time. So we shared CEOs. We'll have to see if we shared some some leadership experience there. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. So 20 years in the organization and you've done, as you said, various roles, which is really, really important because a lot of us have been in these large organizations. Today, we see a lot of people in leadership roles go from one company to another company to another company, 80 months, two years, three years. And being in one company for 20 years, 30 years is a bit rare nowadays. How are you found being in an organization that long and then going from different role to different role, what's it been like for you? Yeah, I'm so glad you say that. Honestly, sometimes I have a little bit of, what's the word, anxiety about having been there so long. And I question myself, like, should I still be here? Like this, this isn't the norm. This isn't what people do. Am I, am I going to impact myself down the line? But, but ultimately the reason I continue to stay so long is because as you've talked about, like leadership is changing, business is changing. So even though it's been one company, I've never stopped learning. I'm still so passionate about our mission. And I love the people I work with that every time I question myself, I'm like, oh my gosh, almost 20 years. That's way too long. I cannot still be here. And then I go through and I ask myself, am I being challenged? Do I have opportunity to learn? Do I believe in what we're doing here? Do I love my team? And I always check all those boxes. So I've just continued to stay. But yeah, it's been, there have been times where it's been really hard and times where it's been really exciting. And you can imagine it's been all the emotions and all the things. It's like you get everything that you want in life and in leadership roles all in one place, right? It's a one-stop shop. And yeah, I, I get it because I spent many years within EDS slash Hewlett Packard and you had so many things to work on. It was like a new organization every time. And there was mergers and acquisitions and then there was changes of CEOs and leaders and you were going through constant change while also being in the same foundation. But there was that one thing, and I and, and I think you've you hit it on the head. It's and either way I look at it, it's the DNA of the organization. It's the people you work with. I seriously miss the people that I used to work with in, in the organizations. And it's it's friendships, it's it's people, and we still hang around together and things like that. I think it's something that's really, really important for us to have is as a community of people nowadays, in particular, 
when we are working at home alone so much? Oh, I could not agree more than that's like, in fact, really joining eBay really after undergrad, like some of my best friends I met there because, you know, being in your early twenties, like that's where you meet your work friends, you know, and they become your sort of leadership circle, if you will, where, where they just stay with you. So some of them are still there and many of them have moved on. Many of them have left and come back. So I totally agree. And it's, it's really interesting to think about the return to office and what that means. I think a lot of people are talking about like, oh man, why did I ever go into the office? I can sit at home in my sweatpants and drink my coffee without my commute. But to your point, I think there is a future where that human face-to-face connection still does add so much value and is important for leadership and for organizations. So it'll be interesting to keep watching, you know, how all these companies adjust and decide to, you know, I think most are saying we're going to be doing the hybrid, um, you know, experience. So it'll be interesting to see how that all turns out. But I completely agree that that human connection is so, so important, especially when you're leading teams and when you want to connect with your leadership. Yeah, yeah. Now, talking about leadership there, you just mentioned, how did you get into leadership? Yeah, great question. As I was thinking about coming to chat with you, I was like, how did I get into leadership? And oddly enough, I'm going to bring it back to like high school. Ultimately, I was a, we are a big sports family. And so um, I'm a big sports person. I played softball, soccer, and tennis growing up. And like looking back, like that's really where I started my leadership journey Whenever I was on a team, I often find myself stepping up and sort of setting the tone and the culture. And I think that's where I really sort of kind of realized, oh, I love people and I love leading them and I love creating a good experience. And so that ultimately took me into college and then into eBay. In college, I even led some teams like really funny jobs, like I managed a movie theater. And so I had to manage employees of the movie theater. And so, you know, that was a tricky one because I'm, you know, mostly managing people my age and a similar experience. So I actually think as silly as it is, I learned so much from it. And then coming into eBay, kind of same thing. Like I immediately, it was intended to be a temporary job. It was shortly after September 11th, having mentioned I've been here almost 20 years and the economy was weird. What I thought I was going to do was not happening anymore. And so I thought I got a temporary job at eBay. But as I mentioned, I fell in love with the mission and the people. And then slowly but surely, I noticed that I kind of, you know, in meetings, I would be speaking up or I would be supporting other people. And then it just naturally became where I was like, oh, I love helping others and supporting them and leading them. And so that's sort of how I, I fell into it. It was never really a conscious decision, but it's just what felt right. Mm, interesting how you say you fell into it, right? I mean, a lot, I think a lot of people do fall into that leadership role. Now, the sports that you said were softball, tennis? And soccer, football for maybe for you, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 soccer, yeah, football, yeah, cool. So we, we shared CEOs and now we share sports, right? I mean, I used to play as a kid softball and then tennis, things like that. So Hey, this is good. Oh my gosh, Excellent. I love it. Yeah, those are my favorite. Yeah, I was thinking about like in tennis, I was as a senior, I was first singles, you know, which meant that I was intended to be the best. And it was really interesting because I felt like I culturally led the team, but then I had to fight for that position officially, you know, so that's how I think. And like we've, I have two boys and we really, you know, they love, luckily they love sports, so we don't really have to push them. But that's one of the main reasons I do push them into sports is like seeing them, you know, grow their leadership skills at such a young age. I think of my 13 year old, he's been on a baseball team for about a year. And just this last weekend, they went and won a tournament. And I think it's largely because of his own leadership and the way he's changed the culture and the team to really care about one another. It felt like originally they were all sort of individuals working on a team. And over this weekend, I've just watched them become a team and fighting together. And it's been really cool to see even in my kids. Oh, sure. I was born in the Soviet Union. Talking about why I'm in leadership and change, you can imagine that Soviet Union as a region has gone through tremendous amount of disruption and change in the last hundred years. So I was born to a family of uh, political dissidents. Most of my great grandparents and grandparents I executed. And I grew up searching for a way to live in the world that felt a little bit more hopeful. So that's my background. Wow. 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 What an amazing background. And so when did you, were you born in the US? Did you move to the US? I was born in the Soviet Union, the part of the Soviet Union that is now called Kazakhstan. And most people don't know a few things about Kazakhstan. Number one, it's the ninth largest country in the world. So we have a lot of land and almost no people. Why do we have almost no people? Because about 90 years ago, in the late 
20, 1920s, early 1930s, the Soviet Union government created a genocide that murdered 40% of Kazakh people. So wow. this is the history of my land. I came to America on a scholarship to study civic education, psychology, and management in 1998. Excellent. And you've got a doctorate in organizational behavior, is that right? Absolutely. That was an absolute gift. This was my professor group, a group of professors in college who pretty much kicked me. <laughs> uh, I was, I was refusing to do a doctorate and I wanted to go to New York City where all of my friends went after college and they said, you will not be happy. So you will apply and you will say no only when they say no. So I went on and did my doctorate very, very young, right after a bachelor degree. Wow. Brilliant. Excellent. And so what was the transition like for you coming to the U.S. to live or going to the U.S. to live? Well, what was that transition like for you? Well, everything you can imagine. I came here in 98. At that time, we had no emails. I called my parents once a month on a five-minute prepaid card. And for the remaining of the months, they didn't know if I was alive or dead. The best guess was that if I'm dead, they will be informed. That's mm. about it. I love the amazing quality of education. I got such a glorious education in terms of uh, my college and then later my doctorate. I went to school in upstate New York. Then I went to Case Western. There is no way I can ever repay the quality and the care that I got during my education. And that carried me through. Uh, I think mm. the, the care of professors and community around me is what carried me through. Yeah, isn't it wonderful when you get the right people around you to support you? It's amazing what you can go off and, and achieve and be, which is which is brilliant. And I think it's really important that we do network. But I think the key I'm going to say here with a caveat is that you have the right people around you. And I think that's really, really important. I am with you. I think the combination makes magic that can never be explained with rational thought. Uh, yeah. Why did we blossom so much? Mm. This collection of kids who barely spoke any English and we all have glorious careers around the world because we were at the right place at the right time with an amazing group of professors. Yeah, and, and then how did you come together with those professors, right? In other words, how did that all happen? It's like magic. It's really, really amazing. To, to see as well. So Nadia, how did you get into leadership? That was a story long before I left the Kazakhstan land, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So you can picture this Soviet Union collapsed without any prior warning. There was no referendum. There was no discussion. There was no vote. There was no warning. Three people got drunk in the woods and signed dissolution documents. The president of our country was in flight trying to stop them at the time of this happening. And right. he was too late. So one day we wake up. We have no government, no police, no ministers, no health care, no nothing. My country was so taken by surprise that it took us almost three years to develop our own currency. So there was this absolute wow. vacuum on the ground. And at that point, in just a few years later, 1992, I believe, an amazing organization was born called Association of Young Leaders. It was mm. born in partnership with California Association of Student Councils. And the goal was to give basic leadership skills to young people, people in their late teens, early 20s. And imagine my surprise that after being trained at a association of young leaders conferences and then becoming a facilitator and a coach, I come to do my doctorate and I learned that what we were teaching and using was actual science. I was just blown away. But we were introduced to Tuckman's theory of group development, for example, a lot of tools on strategic planning and many other things in leadership theory that I use to this day. So I got very, very lucky that in a very young age, I was introduced to some of the best leadership thinking in the world because of this vacuum, this opening that was left out of the collapse and the rebels of the Soviet Union. So did you actually have a desire to be a leader? Was that, where, where was that, that desire to get involved and learn about leadership? Where did that come from? But you see, I have a, a particular point of view on leadership. Right. I do not believe that you are a leader in the sense of a title or a noun. Leadership for me is a space you enter and exit many times a day. 
Yeah. I do leadership or I enter this space called leadership 20 times a day and then I exit. And it is a choice, a particular mode of activity or my particular way of operating around the world that comes as a cocktail with many other forms of operation and many other forms of behavior. So I felt like I need the skill set because many times during the day, I need that particular activity if I want to be successful. Mm. Mm. I like it how you enter into a space and you exit it as well as a leader. And maybe similar to the way I look at it as, as well as sometimes we have a it's like baseball caps, right? Mm-hmm. So you might be a, a coach, a leader, a mentor, and a trainer, possibly. And within a certain discussion or conversation, I might be changing that cap, those caps a lot, right? So I might be entering it. So, but I like the way that you put it that you can enter into that space and exit out as, out as well, because there will be times where you are the leader and there'll be other times where you're the follower or you may be doing other things as well. And I really like that whole analogy that you just shared. I love Mm. that. Well, it comes from a nomadic culture. I think most Aboriginal societies around the world and Kazakhs are nomads that still to this day don't have their own alphabet. We used to borrow our Arabic and currently we're using Cyrillic, but our own alphabet is oral because we never wrote things down. Nomads don't write things down. So the traditional Aboriginal cultures all look at leadership as a circle, as a dynamic force that is larger than any human being. And you enter the circle and you exit the circle. You don't hold (laughs) the power indefinitely. So you can find it in a lot of mythical traditions. You will find it in a lot of kind of processes and organizational structures of a typical council in a typical village. It's very circular and it's very much a space type of metaphor. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. And even if we think about today, like if we go and say to the Western world and we look at other countries, that they have communities. That's really a circle. There's 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 the circle, right? And then uh, I don't know about you, Nadia, but I know that in a lot of uh, what you said before about it's not just about a title. Because a lot of a lot of people have this title and they think they're the leader. No, you're not. Because you, if I look around, there's not many people who are actually following you. You just got it there because of the title, right? But I think the other thing is, you know, we're being an influential person is really important, but it's also quite hard. In other words, if you've got the title, you're the title, your compensation and benefits are associated with that person. So you better do what they say and listen. That's sometimes how we look at it. But if you go into the community groups, not for profits and things like that, a lot of people aren't being paid. They're volunteers. So you as a leader need to be a lot more influential. And so to bring them into the circle, when you've got to go into that circle of being a leader and then sometimes coming out of it as well, I think it's that's just a beautiful way of saying it. I think it's really, 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 really cool. Hmm. Hmm. Now, you, because you've worked with a lot of leaders and uh, you've probably got a lot of experience around many of them. Who's your favorite leader? Now, this person can be a libel from history. Who's your favorite leader and why? I'm not very original in what I have to say. I believe that it's all about our close family. And for me, it's definitely my parents and my daughter. This is the surprising thing is that most of what impacted my life comes from very close circle. But I'll give you an example of how my daughter leads my life. She's 17. And half of my stories in business come from stories of my daughter. I'll give you one. A couple of years ago, she was about 14. We were in Croatia. And we were walking on the coast and having a conversation about how important she is in our life and how we don't want to lose the connection. And she said, oh, don't worry, guys. You are two of my three favorite people. And she's a single child. And we're like, what the heck? We're two of the three. Who is the third who can raise up to the level of like what? And we're like, we, we, we kind of respect. We say, Lila, two of the three, who is the third? And she said, me. I'm my favorite person. Whoa. I, to this day, I'm still not reaching that level of honesty. If I honestly say to myself, am I my favorite person? To this day, I'm not. And she's already there. Wow. Did this, oh. <laughs> that is awesome. Did it leave you speechless? Uh, yes. To this day, it leaves me speechless because I need to learn that kind of way of leading oneself first. I think when we learn to love ourselves and lead ourselves, fully taking responsibility for every single choice and doing it with a lot of love, 
then we can lead everyone else. So in my, in that sense, I'm not original. My parents, my child, those are the people who still to this day are my greatest leadership role models. Yeah, that's wonderful. Oh, what a great story. And, you know, isn't it interesting how the young ones, the, the kids and that, they just look at things so simple. And yet again, us as, in, as, as, as growing ups, as we call them, we look, th- look at things, but we make things so complicated. And at the end of the day, ask a kid what they think, they'll tell you, and you'll probably, you probably get the truth. you probably understand. And, you know, oh, wow, what a wonderful story. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leadership is Changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change, inspiring executives and leaders to adapt and lead a bigger game in a fast-moving world. 